Mr Prime Minister, I welcome you to the House of Representatives Chamber. Your address today is a significant occasion in the history of the House of Representatives. I now call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today we welcome the Prime Minister of Singapore, Prime Minister Lee, his wife Ho Ching, and a delegation of senior Singaporean ministers, MPs and officials to our Australian Parliament. This is an auspicious occasion. It is the first time a Singaporean Prime Minister has addressed the Australian Parliament. And we are privileged to welcome today a leader who is a great friend of Australia. We appreciate the role Prime Minister Lee has played in transforming our successful relationship formed in the late 20th century into a partnership fit for the challenges and the opportunities of the 21st century. Australians have long admired Singapore and its resilient, diverse and creative people. Last year was bittersweet for Singapore. The nation celebrated its 50th anniversary and mourned the passing of her founding father, Mr Lee Kuan Yew, whose son we welcome to our parliament today as his nation's Prime Minister. Prime Minister, your father was one of the giants of the 20th century. He founded a nation whose only assets were its people and its location and created what has become a 21st century city-state, one which embraces the rapid march of technology and science just as it does the trade and open markets upon which its success has been established. Australia was the first country to establish diplomatic relations with Singapore, but the relationship was forged even before that in the fires of World War II and the defence of Singapore in which over 1,700 Australians lost their lives. More than 1,000 of them are buried in Singapore's soil at Kranji Cemetery. In the decades since, Australia's friendship with Singapore has flourished. We are, after all, quite natural partners, highly sophisticated, educated and multicultural societies with open economies. Both our countries have embraced the opportunities presented by our steadfast commitment to rules-based trade to deliver more jobs and higher incomes for our people. Singapore is Australia's fifth largest trading partner and foreign investor. As Asia continues to grow, our shared prosperity will benefit from greater integration and collaboration between our complementary economies. Alongside our economic partnership, our two countries share a common strategic outlook. Today, on the anniversary of the Bali bombing in 2002, we reaffirm our steadfast solidarity in the battle against extremism and the terrorism which it spawns, an anathema to the tolerance and diversity our societies cherish. Together with our friends and allies, we collaborate more closely than ever to prevent and disrupt those terrorists who seek to do us harm. We seek a future for our region governed by shared norms of behaviour and respect for international law, and one marked by stable relations among the major powers. Singapore and Australia are at one in defending the rule of law and rejecting the proposition that might is right. Australia and Singapore are firm proponents of institutions that support regional stability and prosperity, such as ASEAN, and the East Asia Summit. And I'm delighted that Singapore will be ASEAN's chair when Australia hosts the ASEAN leaders for an historic summit here in 2018. The relationship our two countries enjoy is in great shape and would, Mr Speaker, be an easy one to allow to evolve along its natural course. But that would be denying both countries the rewards of even closer cooperation. Last year, on the 50th anniversary of diplomatic relations, Prime Ministers Lee and Abbott signed the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership, a 10-year plan to expand the frontiers of our bilateral cooperation across economic, strategic and people-to-people -people dimensions. Tomorrow, our governments will sign the first tranche of initiatives under our Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. 
We will update the Singapore-Australia Free Trade Agreement to drive unprecedented economic integration with our Asian neighbour. The agreement will include new measures intended to improve mobility for business people, give better access to government procurement, reduce red tape and make it easier for Singapore to invest in Australia. It will foster further trade and investment, helping both countries to seize the economic opportunities of our growing region. One of the most exciting economic opportunities is in the field of science, technology and innovation. And I was struck by Prime Minister Lee's National Day address this year, in which he discussed the way in which technology was transforming Singapore's economy and society. The Prime Minister spoke thoughtfully about the anxiety this caused to those working in industries that are disrupted by technological change. He spoke enthusiastically of the opportunities. Above all, Prime Minister Lee showed himself as a leader who rejected the populist cries for less trade, more protection, less change, and instead he embraced the future while maintaining an inclusive and cohesive society. So we have very similar world views, and it is fitting, therefore, that our closer relationship with Singapore will include a new partnership that will open up collaborations between our world-renowned research institutions, Australia's CSIRO and Singapore's ASTAR. Soon we will establish an innovation landing pad in Singapore to provide a platform for Australian startups to team up with their Singaporean counterparts and Singapore-based industry and capital to bring their ideas to market and accelerate and amplify the already strong collaboration between our two countries' innovators. Tomorrow, Prime Minister Lee and I will also inaugurate a new chapter in our defence relationship. My government has agreed to expand access for Singapore's armed forces to training grounds in Australia. These grounds in North Queensland will be co-developed by Australia and Singapore and will make a long-term and very beneficial difference to local economies and jobs. Our decision to grant Singapore this special level of access underlies the enormous trust and respect that exist between our respective armed forces. It also reflects our commitment to do more as security partners, especially as our strategic circumstances change and evolve. Mr Speaker, I've spoken of our like-mindedness with Singapore, our shared interests and our complementary strengths. I want to conclude with some fond words about our similar national characters. We are countries with different histories and different cultural traditions. Yet we are countries familiar and comfortable with one another. We prize informality. We are suspicious of pretense. We speak plainly and with pragmatism as friends should. We focus on outcomes and delivery, not pomp or protocol. Each of us can lay claim to be among the most successful multicultural societies in the world. So our bright future is not just about complementary interests and strengths. It's about common human qualities. To borrow from Prime Minister Lee, I, and I'm sure all members of this parliament, are immensely reassured that our relationship with Singapore springs from the heart as much as it does from the head. I thank the Prime Minister. I call on the Honourable Leader of the Opposition to support the remarks of the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Prime Minister Lee and Mrs Lee, on behalf of the Opposition and the Australian people, welcome to the Australian Parliament. Personally, it's a pleasure for me to meet with you again and all of us are looking forward to your address, to hearing in this place the Singapore story, the story of a people who came through the turbulence surrounding them, the Malayan emergency, Confrontasi, the Sukarno split, the challenges at home, a newly independent economy seemingly without the room or resources to grow. But from this uncertainty, Singaporeans have emerged as the proud citizens and architects of a modern, thriving, engaged and open nation. Prime Minister Lee, 
Your father, more than anyone else, began this story, and you have authored your own distinguished chapter. Your presence here speaks for the strong bonds between our nations, as well as a reminder of just how far Australia has come. When we first established our formal ties in 1965, Singapore existed in the Australian consciousness primarily as a reminder of the days in which we faced our gravest threat, the fall of the supposedly invincible British garrison, nearly 15,000 Australian prisoners of war captured and brutalised. Australian blood was shed in the defence of Singapore. Australians still lie at rest in Cranji Cemetery. And even when peace came, Australians still imagined ourselves fearfully perched on the edge of Asia. Today, Prime Minister, we give thanks those days are long gone. Today, Singapore and Australia greet each other as equals and friends. Whilst we both share a common strand of British heritage, I believe, like the Prime Minister, that more importantly, we share in the common quality of informality. We are, partners, we are partners in prosperity, respected voices in ASEAN, APEC and the East Asia Summit, known as advocates for peace and security in our region and the wider world. In Afghanistan, our troops served alongside one another, holding back the forces seeking a base for terrorism. And Labor welcomes the comprehensive strategic partnership that will see up to 14,000 Singaporean troops train at Shoalwater Bay in Queensland per year. This is good news for the regions and good news for our region. And both our nations are engaged in countering the new threat of extremism, the fight against Daesh, its agents and imitators. We also share a tradition of learning from each other. From your father's famous warning, a rebuke that shook Australia out of the lethargy and certainly my own party's pursuit of an open, outward-looking economy engaged with the markets of Asia. This legacy we commemorated in this parliament in our condolence motions last year. And we still see the merit of openness, new markets and new investment, not the least because we see the success of Singapore. Prime Minister Lee, as the top maths student of your Cambridge undergraduate class, the senior wrangler, and perhaps the only world leader who can solve Sudoku in computer code. <laughs> we know your passion for the sciences runs deep. Your country's embrace of technology, science and the value of ideas helps inspire Australian policymakers. Our nations have also grown through cultural exchange. Personally, I vividly still recall being well and truly outpointed by the slickly prepared Singaporean university team at InterVarsity debating in the late 1980s. Perhaps more importantly, though, 130,000 Singaporeans have gained degrees in Australian universities, including some of the guests you bring with you, your permanent secretaries here today, Peter Ong, Chan Yang Kit, Chan Lai Fung. And there are more than 20,000 Australian expatriates living and working in Singapore, including friends of mine who voted at the Royal Tanglin Golf Course at the polling booth in the last three weeks of June a booth we targeted most heavily. <laughs> These Australians, of course, return to their friends and family, praising a place where they know they're welcome. Singapore is a culture that is different enough to feel novel, familiar enough to feel at home. There's the brilliant public transport, the dynamic workplaces, which your government has made stronger and more balanced by legislating a five-day week. And, of course, in Singapore, it's the food. It always comes back to the food. <laughs> Indeed, when Joseph Schooling, who at the age of 13, had the thrill of meeting his hero, Michael Phelps, and at the age of 21, had the joy of beating Michael Phelps in the 100 metre butterfly at Rio, making history as Singapore's first ever Olympic gold medalist. Even the kid who defeated the king paid tribute to the stallholders who gave him free vegetables as a child. <laughs> and he celebrated his victory with a traditional black carrot cake at the Marine Terrace Hawker Centre. But Prime Minister Lee, I have since learned that this new Singaporean idol, hero, 
was merely seeking to follow in your footsteps, trying to replicate the national social media sensation you caused when you were spotted queuing for over 30 minutes for your favourite type of chicken wings. <laughs> Prime Minister Lee, Australia has no closer friend in Asia than Singapore. Let us work together to an even stronger, richer friendship in the years ahead. Welcome and enjoy your stay. Yeah. I thank the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Prime Minister, on behalf of senators and members, can I now also welcome your official party to the floor of the House. And, Mr Prime Minister, it gives me great pleasure to invite you to address the House. Mr Speaker, the Honourable Malcolm Turnbull, Prime Minister, the Honourable Stephen Parry, President of the Senate, the Honourable Bill Shorten, Leader of the Opposition, Senators and Members of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for your warm welcome. I'm honoured to address you in this Parliament House today. I'm also very happy that with a comprehensive strategic partnership with the CSP, Singapore's relationship with Australia has reached another significant milestone. Singapore's ties with Australia go back into history. During the Second World War, as you've heard, Australian troops fought bravely to defend Malaya and Singapore. Many gave their lives. After Singapore fell, on the 15th of February 1942. Some 15,000 Australians became prisoners of war in Changi. They built the Changi Chapel, which was re-erected after the war at the Royal Military College in Dantroon. Singapore will never forget their sacrifice. During the Malayan emergency, Australian soldiers fought communist guerrillas in the Malayan jungles. When Singapore joined Malaysia in 1963, President Sukarno of Indonesia launched Konfrontasi, a low-intensity conflict to undermine the new federation. Australian forces defended Malaysia in Malaya and Borneo. In 1965, Singapore separated from Malaysia to become an independent republic. You were one of the first countries to recognize our independence and the first to establish diplomatic relations with us. You played a key role in establishing the five power defense arrangements in 1971. The FPDA provided critical security to a new and vulnerable country and remains relevant to this day. Through these momentous events, our leaders worked closely together, got to know each other well, and established warm personal friendships. When Sir Robert Menzies passed away in 1978, Mr Lee Kuan Yew, our founding Prime Minister, wrote a condolence letter to Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser, which was read out in the Australian Parliament. When Mr Lee passed away in March last year, the Australian Parliament moved a motion to honour his contributions to bilateral relations, and Mr Tony Abbott attended Mr Lee's state funeral service as Prime Minister. The people of Singapore were deeply touched by these gestures of sympathy and friendship. How is it that Australia and Singapore, two very different countries, as Prime Minister Turnbull said, a wide brown land and a little red dot, <laughs> can forge such a deep bond? In land area, Australia is more than 10,000 times the size of Singapore. We are smaller than many sheep farms. <laughs> the ACT alone is three times the size of Singapore. Australia has abundant natural resources. Singapore has none. We even have to import water from Malaysia. We are both Commonwealth countries, yes, but historically, Australia has been Anglo-Saxon in composition and identity, while Singapore is an Asian society even though we speak English and we have the cosmopolitan outlook of a port city. 
And yet we are good friends because fundamentally we have similar strategic interests and perspectives. First, we are both open economies that rely heavily on international trade, on global markets. We both need a stable and orderly world in which countries, big and small, can prosper in peace. And this requires an open and in an inclusive social regional order where all the major powers can participate. We both see the United States as a benign force playing a major role in fostering peace and stability in Asia. At the same time, we both have substantial ties with other major powers. For both of us, China is our largest trading partner. We wish to strengthen our cooperation with China and welcome China in engaging constructively with the region. For instance, we both participate in the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, an initiative proposed by China. Secondly, we both want to deepen ties between Australia and Southeast Asia. Australia has decided that its future lies in Asia. Singapore believes that strengthening Australia's links with Asia will help to keep the region open. Australia took the first step by becoming ASEAN's first dialogue partner in 1974. Singapore and Australia also work closely to launch the ASEAN Regional Forum, where countries regularly, regularly discuss political and security issues. I'm glad that Prime Minister Turnbull has invited ASEAN to a summit in Australia in 2018, two years from now. Singapore will be the ASEAN chair then and will continue to support Australia's engagement with ASEAN. These key priorities were reflected in Prime Minister Bob Hawke's strategic move to launch APEC, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, in 1989. At that time, the Uruguay round of multilateral trade negotiations were deadlocked. APEC aimed to liberalize trade in the Asia-Pacific and to give a push to global trade. Singapore was happy to support Australia. I participated in the first APEC meeting here in Canberra as Minister for Trade and Industry. I'm very pleased that APEC has since grown and become an active platform where the leaders discuss global economic challenges. But Singapore and Australia do not only share similar strategic interests. Our two peoples have similar outlooks. Our societies are open, inclusive and multicultural. We value our ethnic and religious diversity and appreciate the different races and cultures in our midst. We accept change as the way forward and look outwards to the world for inspiration, ideas and opportunities. Our people are open and direct. We are pragmatic and focused on solving problems. We think and talk in clear practical terms and therefore connect on the same wavelength. It doesn't mean that we agree on everything, but when we have different views, we do not beat around the bush. We express ourselves candidly, address our differences, and can narrow or at least define the gap because we know where each other stands. Our societies are both egalitarian. We don't stand on ceremony, and we frown on rigid social hierarchies. We are informal and can hang loose. Thus, when Prime Minister Abbott visited Singapore last year, I could invite him to join my constituents for an Aussie-style BBQ at a public park, <laughs> only to discover that he was much better at barbecuing than I was. <laughs> Afterwards, uh, we went to dinner nearby. <laughs> I made sure to choose some good Australian wine. <laughs> but alas, I neglected to check the steak. After dinner, after dinner, Prime Minister Abbott asked the chef where the beef was from. And the chef, with Singaporean directness and candor, replied, from the US, sir. <laughs> 
I will have to do better when Prime Minister Turnbull visits us next year. I have often personally experienced Australian warmth and hospitality. I first came to Australia nearly 50 years ago in 1967 as a teenager on an exchange visit. I stayed with a family in Melbourne, the Blanche family. Their son, Graham, was about my age and we quickly became friends. And the Blanches took me to their holiday home at Mount Martha on the Mornington Peninsula. The first night for dinner, not knowing what to expect, I put on a tie. <laughs> <coughs> Graham stared at me and said, you're crazy, take it off. He taught me something about Australian informality that I haven't forgotten. I've stayed in touch with the Blanche family for all this half a century, so I'm very glad that today Graham, his siblings, Balfour and Heather, and their spouses are here with us to share this special occasion. And I'm sure that many other Singaporean and Australian families enjoy similar close personal ties and lifelong friendships. This shared strategic outlook and ethos, and social ethos, is why Singapore and Australia have done so many things together. Many Singaporean entrepreneurs have invested in Australia. They are confident of Australia's future and comfortable with the business culture. More than 20,000 Australians live and work in Singapore in all sorts of professions. The Singapore-Australia Free Trade Agreement, SAFTA, signed in 2003, was Australia's first FTA outside of New Zealand. It has helped make Little Singapore your fifth largest trading partner and investor. We've also worked together on regional economic integration, first with APEC and now with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the RCEP. Our two countries cooperate closely on security issues and humanitarian missions. Our security agencies work closely and quietly together to fight terrorism, sharing intelligence and information carrying out counter-terrorism operations, exchanging notes on religious rehabilitation and de-radicalization programs. It's important always, and is especially worth mentioning today on the anniversary of the Bali bombings. The Singapore Armed Forces and the Australian Defence Force train and operate together. They conduct joint bilateral and multilateral exercises and attend each other's military courses. We are grateful that you have for many years welcomed our troops to train in Australia, particularly at Oki and Shoalwater Bay in Queensland and the RAAF base Pierce in Western Australia. I hope we have been good guests. Our forces have operated alongside each other in Uruzgan in Afghanistan, worn blueberries in East Timor and Cambodia, and cooperated in anti-piracy operations in the North Arabian Gulf. In Iraq and Syria, we are fighting ISIS together as part of the counter-ISIS coalition. And our tankers have refueled your F-18 fighters regularly. These deployments reflect our shared strategic priorities and have built camaraderie and a sense of common purpose among our troops. I know these not just as abstract principles, but through personal experience. Years ago, in 1983, we had a cable car accident in Singapore. Thirteen people were trapped in the cable cars to Sentosa after an oil rig snagged the cable. I was then serving in the armed forces and directed the rescue operations. We dispatched two helicopters with winchmen to rescue the trapped passengers. One of the pilots was a young Royal Australian Navy officer. Lieutenant Jeff Ledger. He was on exchange with the Republic of Singapore Air Force, helping to build up its search and rescue capability. He did not have to fly this mission, but he did, piloting one of the helicopters. It was a risky operation at night under windy conditions, but fortunately the rescue succeeded. 
Jeff Ledger has since retired from active duty as a Commodore, and I'm glad that he's here too to share this special occasion with us. In education, through the generosity of your Colombo Plan scholarships, hundreds of Singaporeans received university education in Australia and went on to contribute in our society and government. They include two presidents, several cabinet ministers, two heads of civil service, many senior public servants, some of whom are here today. Beyond the Colombo Plan, Australia has welcomed and educated over 100,000 Singapore students. In the other direction, many Australian students come to Singapore on exchange programs. I'm glad that Foreign Minister Julie Bishop had the vision to champion the new Colombo Plan. By the end of this year, Singapore universities will have welcomed some 800 Australian new Colombo Plan students. They will continue the spirit of exchange and renew the connections and goodwill between our peoples into the next generation. Our people also visit each other frequently. Last year, some 400,000 Singaporeans visited Australia and one million Australians visited Singapore. Some come for education or business, more come for holidays or to visit family and friends. We feel quite at home in each other's countries. Singaporeans may not quaff quite as much beer as Australians, but I have it on good authority that Victoria bitter goes well with chilli crabs. <laughs> indeed, indeed, many of us have families living in both countries starting with Prime Minister Turnbull. I was very glad to learn last year that the Prime Minister had a new granddaughter, Isla, born in Singapore during our Golden Jubilee, our SG50 year. In Singapore, we would call her an SG50 baby. But because it was also the 50th anniversary of Singapore-Australia diplomatic relations, she is also an SA50 baby. <laughs> For these compelling reasons, I'm happy that Prime Minister Turnbull and I have concluded the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership, an ambitious package that enhances core aspects of our cooperation and brings together our complementary strengths. I thank Prime Minister Turnbull for his strong backing for the CSP and indeed the whole coalition team and colleagues from Labour and the crossbenches for your continued support. In defence under the CSP, the Singapore Armed Forces will have more training, space and opportunities in Australia. With a 25-year horizon, we will jointly develop state-of-the-art facilities in Australia. This will improve the quality of our training and help to overcome Singapore's size and constraints. Our two armed forces will have more opportunities to train together and enhance interoperability. And I think more Singaporean servicemen will go home with sheepskins and little koala bears. <laughs> In trade liberalisation, an upgraded SAFTA will make it easier for our professionals and entrepreneurs to work in each other's countries. And the CSP also covers innovation and science. Australia has in the CSIRO a very well-developed institute for scientific research. Singapore also emphasises the importance of R&D to our economy and we have ASTAR, the Agency for Science, Technology and Research, to lead our efforts. We've identified some key challenges to tackle, including basic urban problems like water supply and energy conservation. And we have much scope to cooperate more in R&D. Arts and culture will also get a boost, building on the rich exchanges we've had. A new Australia-Singapore Arts Group will steer the deepening of exchanges between our museums, art festivals, visual and performing arts. Through these exchanges, the CSP will cement our partnership for many years to come. Mr. Speaker, the CSP will enable Singapore and Australia to do much together. It is fitting to celebrate this milestone in our friendship in this Parliament House. It has a special link with Singapore which Honourable Members may or may not know about. 
30 years ago, Singapore planned to build a new tri-service military institute for our Singapore Armed Forces. We studied military ac academies in other countries, including ADFA, and searched for a suitable architect to do the project. We eventually found Mr. Romaldo Jergala, who had built this Parliament House. My first visit to this Parliament House was in 1989, when I was in Canberra for the inaugural APEC meeting. Mr. Jergler gave me a guided tour and explained his architectural vision. He showed how he had made it open and accessible to the public, how the building emerges from the landscape, and how people can walk around it as well as on the grass ramps which cover the building. It's impressive without being imposing and reflected the spirit of the Australian Parliament, open, integrated with the community. Mr. Jergler's design reflected how he saw the architect's duty, to reflect the spirit of the institution in the building and not to impose his own view. After seeing the Parliament House, I felt much reassured that we had found the right architect for our Safdie Military Institute, who would understand our needs and express intangible but crucial values in brick and mortar. And indeed, we are happy with what Mr. Jergler built for us. Our Safdi MI is on a much more modest scale than your Parliament House, but it too has an open concept symbolising the close ties between our national service, service force and our citizenry and society. We are also happy that over the years, many Australian officers have trained at the Safdi Military Institute and form bonds of friendship and understanding with their Singaporean classmates, which will serve our two countries well. In all these diverse and profound ways, our two countries are linked together by our shared history, by strategic alignment, by shared ethos, by personal friendships, by what we do together, and even by our architecture. Our partnership is greater than the sum of its parts. I look forward to Singapore and Australia working together to deepen and to strengthen it and enabling our peoples to prosper in peace and friendship for many, many more years to come. Thank you very much.